From Dragon Ball to Demon Slayer, Yu Yu Hakusho to Jujutsu Kaisen, Weekly Shonen Jump is the engine driving some of the greatest success stories in the history of commercially successful storytelling. To anime fans, they've long stood as a standard bearer for consistently high quality and creative high concepts in the hyper-competitive shonen market, producing I wouldn't quite say nothing but bangers, just about every anime fan I know has a personal vendetta against at least one long-running overrated jump title, but certainly their series do tend to make a big splash on arrival and stick around long after. Well, if you only watch anime, that's certainly how it seems, but manga readers know the truth that the fuel Jump's success engine runs on is made of crushed potential and broken dreams. For every series that runs in the magazine's pages for years and years and years, there are half a dozen that don't even make it half a dozen months. Jump's editorial board is only able to find all these different stories with the potential to become world-beating franchises as quickly and consistently as they do by introducing and burning through new IP at an astounding rate, killing off any title that fails to find an audience to make room for the next big thing as quickly as possible. For all their multi-million dollar multimedia marketing campaigns, so much of Shueisha and Jump's business model ultimately boils down to the tried and true strategy of throwing a bunch of shit at the wall to see what sticks, which certainly works quite well for them, but leaves a lot of fans feeling like that bus jacker from Sakamoto days and and a lot of artists burned out and bummed out with nothing to show for it but a half-finished prologue to the story of their dreams. But maybe there's more that we can find there. By digging through the jump graveyard and trying to figure out why individual series might have been cancelled, perhaps we can learn some lessons about what does and doesn't work with this style of storytelling in this particular market. What sort of seemingly small problems can kill off a property seemingly brimming with potential before it even begins. And in the case of certain manga where it's really, really obvious why they were canceled, I was able to find some of the best roasting fodder I've ever seen that wasn't made by a literal cult. So please look forward to hearing me tear into a few manga like that in the back half of this video. In the front half though, we're gonna try to be constructive and productive. And I'd like to start by looking at a series that I once recommended in a video that I'm 90% sure was cursed because half of the series I mentioned in it were canceled within a month of me dropping it. One, because the author touched children, a crime for which he got an 18-month suspended sentence because the Japanese legal system is a bad joke and a judge ruled the manga cancellation constituted sufficient punishment from society. Seriously. Thankfully, we get to talk about the cancelled manga that's not that one today. Though, before we do, real quick, I just want to make everyone aware, I just got over a real bad cold, and I recorded part of this video right before it got real bad so that my editors would have something to work on. So, uh, if I'm wearing something different or look kind of dead inside through parts of this video, that's why. Time Paradox Ghost Rider had me hooked from the jump with its near flawless execution. The artwork in that series was truly next level, with striking shading, intricate, lived-in feeling environments, and charismatic character designs out the wazoo. And the story behind it all was, in my eyes at least, even better, with a compelling moral quandary at its center and a nuanced philosophical outlook on topics near and dear to my heart, like the artist's struggle, imposter syndrome, and the true meaning of self-expression. Our hero, Tepe, is a struggling mangaka of remarkable artistic talent who nevertheless can't quite manage to create a story that really resonates with people. One day, he finds a Shonen Jump magazine from the future in his microwave, which is a time machine, of course, and in it, the pilot chapter of a fantasy manga epic to rival One Piece. The best damn manga he's ever read. And the title of that manga is White Knight. 
When he awakens the next day with the magazine nowhere in sight, Tepe concludes that he received a flash of inspiration in a dream and successfully pitches White Knight to Jump, getting an immediate publication that same week. Which is basically unheard of in Jump, but the manga really is just that good. An instant classic, a masterpiece among masterpieces. And when another volume of Jump shows up in the microwave right after it's published, with Chapter 2 inside, Side, Tepe realizes that he just stole it from the mastermind behind it. But now he has an obligation to keep that story going, not just for the sake of his own career, which will of course be over for good if he can't, but for all of the fans of his new hit series, which will now never reach its conclusion unless he's the one to finish it. And later he learns, for the sake of the original artist herself too, who was destined to die from overworking on the series before he changed the timeline, and is still in danger of meeting that fate one day soon. Time Paradox Ghost Rider is one of the most genuinely adult manga I've ever had the pleasure of reading in the Jump app, and I genuinely think that was its downfall, because while the dilemma at its heart is really compelling and speaks to a lot of pressing issues in the manga industry, as well as a lot of the hang-ups that a lot of artists have, a lot of readers apparently never got past the initial feeling of outrage that the hero was basically committing plagiarism and getting away with it, which is understandable given the context of how it happened, but perhaps an audience that's still primarily reading superhero comics wasn't really primed to understand it or be charitable toward him. Jump manga and shonen titles at large have gotten darker and, in some respects, more thematically complex in the years since Attack on Titan, but at the end of the day, the magazine is still aimed primarily at middle schoolers for whom the prospect of spending four years pursuing a career goal that ultimately amounts to nothing is a purely abstract concept. Time Paradox Ghost Rider simply failed to find an audience that could really appreciate what it had to say. I honestly think that the rather adult questions that Tepe struggles with throughout the series would probably have been a lot more at home in a seinen manga publication, but then, of course, you wouldn't get the meta appeal of a shonen jump manga about making shonen jump manga, so I guess it's kind of a wash. Even at its short length, though, even in its rushed finale, the series does still manage to say a lot of what it wanted to in an incredibly poignant way and leave a real emotional impact. But that impact is seriously blunted without the proper buildup that ending deserves. It ultimately serves as a sobering reminder that even with the most impressive technical chops on the block and a strong artistic vision, you can't build a career as an artist unless you know your audience and how to give them what they want. But you also have to be able to convey that the thing you have, which they want, isn't something they already have. And for all its efforts, that's sadly a lesson best exemplified by the Hunter's Guild Red Hood. Set in a dark and twisted fantasy world inspired by Grimm's fairy tales, where hidden werewolves torment the populace, opposed by an elite guild of monster hunters, hence the title, Red Hood's equally dark and twisted art style instantly set it apart from everything else in Jump's lineup. Well, almost everything. With its cartoonishly grotesque monster designs, think Ed Roth meets Junji Ito, and brutally zany, over-the-top violence, it does feel of a piece with Chainsaw Man. And that comparison runs more than skin deep. The Hunter's Guild features bold, eye-catching page layouts and panel compositions that frequently break convention without compromising their readability. The artist, Yuki Kawaguchi, is also really good at drawing cool guys walking away from explosions, something that Tatsuki Fujimoto clearly took as a personal challenge because he wrote an entire one-shot that's basically just about a guy who can't help walking away from explosions. Even more than blasts, beasts, and bloodshed, though, Kawaguchi's true area of artistic expertise is booty. 
The manga's titular heroine looks much like the Little Red Riding Hood we know and love from the fairy tales when she first arrives in Protag Kun Velu's village looking for wolves in men's clothing, albeit without her goodie basket. But when the hunt begins, it's quickly revealed that her childlike form is but a byproduct of a wicked curse. And this not-so-Little Red Riding Hood, who goes by Grimm, didn't just bring some piddly little picnic basket with her. Oh no, she's packing the whole damn cake. In a manga industry ruled by smooth midriffs, plunging cleavage, and bare booty, the low-hanging fruits of fan service, Red Hood dared to capture the distinct, mature allure of a really tight-fitting pair of jeans. And perhaps, like Time Paradox Ghost Rider, that very maturity was its downfall. The jump audience simply wasn't ready for all this, or later, all that. Okay, okay, that, that's probably not it. It was probably the story. While Grimm gets title billing, the manga's real protagonist, Velu, is a pretty typical bright-eyed shonen kid who sets out on an equally typical hero's journey to find himself and avenge his adopted family and stuff after the inciting incident Fs his hometown up, you know, like a JRPG or something. And he starts that journey with a training slash license exam arc, as was the style at the time, and is the style at this current time, and has been the style throughout all time for most shonen battle manga, and... Yeah, there are so many manga in the manga industry at large, and the pages of Jump specifically exactly like that, that even with incredible art, brilliant layouts, and stupid awesome fight scenes, Hunter's Guild struggled to stand out. Of course, the manga's creator was well aware of that and planned to use the seemingly generic setup as a springboard for a metafictional exploration of stories and story structure, but all those cool metafictional concepts were tied up in a late-game plot twist that the series never had time to properly set up because its regular fictional concepts just didn't grab people. And then, when they had no choice but to reveal that twist and drop a whole ass apocalypse immediately after the training slash exam arc, there simply wasn't enough time left to properly explore all its cool implications before the manga was finished. Now, if you remove the word metafictional from that sentence, it describes most of the manga that I looked at for this. Spontaneous plot compression, where plot points planned out months or even years in advance suddenly need to hit in a matter of weeks, is the most common sign of an impending jump cancellation. Which makes a lot of sense if you're a writer who's finally gotten a chance to show your stuff in the biggest manga magazine on Earth, you want to show as much of that stuff as possible in the time you've got left on the platform. But if you want to make a manga that actually still holds up, even in an unfinished state, holding some of that back can pay big dividends. Before making a name for himself with My Hero Academia, Kohei Horikoshi graced the pages of Jump with a short-lived but eminently charming science fantasy series called Barrage. Now, it wasn't his debut work, that would be an action gag manga called Omagadaki Zoo, but that's not on the Jump app, so we're talking about Barrage today. Set on a pseudo-medieval planet besieged by alien invaders, the series follows a plucky young orphan named Astro who discovers he's a dead ringer for the crown prince of his country, Barrage. Barrage then swaps places with him, handing off a mystic artifact that will identify Astro as the prince approximately half a second before he discovers that he's a dead. This obviously puts Astro in a bit of an awkward position, since he wants to tell the castle guards who've come to collect him that he's not the real prince, so he can get back to his adorable orphan family and also not have to pretend to be the sort of asshole who hits women, but if he does that, he might get dinged for regicide, which is not a charge that you see a lot of orphans beat. Lucky for him, though, when a dickhead rich alien attacks the city looking for that magic artifact, known as the Org, it chooses Astro as its chosen one, allowing him to wield a 
slightly over-designed magic spear that can take down anyone bearing ill intent in a single blow, which impresses the king enough to hire him on as a replacement son, even in the depths of his grief, meaning that Astro's adorable orphan family will get to live like royalty in the castle. Though, sadly, he won't get to join them since his duty as Crown Prince Barrage is to set off on a journey to kick a bunch of alien asses until eventually the world is saved somehow, accompanied by this night captain guy who looks like if Bakugo grew up to be Aizawa. Many of the character design sensibilities that would come to define My Hero Academia's world are present in Barrage, particularly in the aliens, some of whom make every quirk user this side of the Nomu look downright normal. And the art depicting those designs is as excellent as ever. From the very start, Horikoshi has stood out for his ability to make action scenes sing and characters pop off the page. And his expression game is second only to Gota himself. But the simple, self-evident appeal of his work is hamstrung in Barrage, I think, by a convoluted, genre-blending premise that isn't even fully explained by the time it has to wrap, as in what appears to be the series core power system is only introduced like five chapters before it's over. It's a far cry from the simple and elegant what if everyone had superpowers hook that would eventually make him famous. But even with all that to explain, Horikoshi resisted the urge to cram an explanation for everything into the finale, instead focusing those last few chapters squarely on the completion of Astro's character arc, which he accomplishes by having his hero fight a villain who was once his adopted father figure, kinda for a few months. A villain who, after being defeated and reformed, would conveniently have been able to train Astro in the aforementioned power system had the series been able to continue. But even though it didn't, he still makes a great and thematically appropriate punching bag for Astro to literally beat his ideals about family into one last time. Family is a running theme throughout Barrage, with each new story arc and character speaking to, or against, in the case of villains, a different facet of the concept. Thus, by hinging the series' final fight on that theme instead of trying to expand the world further or instantly save it for the sake of closure, Horikoshi was able to make Barrage feel far more complete and meaningful than it would if he'd just suddenly cut from the middle of a low-key early story arc to whatever big, cool, original ending he originally had planned. Because Obviously, that ending was planned to follow a much longer series than he ended up being able to make, and it wouldn't have been nearly as satisfying as he wanted it to be without that buildup. And I really think his ability to recognize that, to roll with the editorial punches and tell a story that still mostly works within the page limit he was unexpectedly given, marked him out as the rare creator who could actually handle the uniquely brutal pressures of a long-running jump series long before he made it big. Zombie Powder, Tight Kubo's Weird West precursor to Bleach, takes this principle even further, making no sacrifices to its pacing or plotting in favor of exposition or closure, right up until it's completely out of nowhere ending. Which is odd, because even more than Hiroaka, Bleach is the big jump title that I think suffers most from story bloat and padding as it goes on. Looking at both Zombie Powder and Barrage, it's hard not to imagine some theoretical sweet spot between them and their much much bigger younger brothers where the perfect Kubo or Horikoshi manga exists. But of course they don't exist and probably never will. I'm just engaging in wishful thinking, which is only natural when one digs through the jump graveyard. And Zombie Powder's been the subject of more wishful thinking than most manga, thanks to the modest commercial success it enjoyed among American Bleach fans at the height of that series' popularity. Some have even theorized that Zombie Powder was just ahead of its time, that if it had released now in a post-Attack on Titan world where the brutally bloody battles of Jujutsu Kaisen, Chainsaw Man, and Demon Slayer define the jump meta, it could have thrived or maybe even surpassed Bleach. 
I have my doubts, though. Not because it isn't good. That manga fucking slaps, and I would love to see where the story was going next. But because, in addition to raw popularity, Jump values variety. Ayashimon and Phantom Seer both had intense battles, incredible creature designs, gorgeous artwork, great characters, a passionate fan base, and even strong sales, yet neither made it past 30 chapters because they just weren't strong enough to justify keeping them alongside the already successful Spooky Big Three. Not when that space could be filled with something like Blue Box that has the potential to draw in a totally different audience for the magazine. The sad reality is that an aspiring mangaka can have great execution that resonates with Jump's readers and great ideas fully in line with current anime trends and still get cancelled because they just missed the boat on those trends by a couple months. Speaking of boats, I have a sneaking suspicion that the omnipresence of One Piece, the greatest adventure story ever drawn, coupled with the ever-looming specter of Hunter Hunter's return from hiatus, has had a similar chilling effect on adventure manga in Jump. From Red Hood, which we've already touched on, to Guardian of the Witch with its deep mystical mysteries, to Red Sprite with its strikingly gorgeous electricity-based power system and badass airships, to Barrage, come to think of it, so, so many of the cancelled jump manga that I've looked at got me hyped to set off on a lengthy, immersive journey only to stumble at the very first step. Though maybe that also has to do with hesitation on the audience's part. I mean, adventure serials can be seriously fatiguing to follow, and they frequently let those invested in them down before they're over, which Jump gives especially good reason to be wary of, particularly with these new titles, because... Well, I, I think I may have misrepresented things a bit by focusing so much on series with lost potential. For every promising original premise that Jump has given the axe, there are, again, half a dozen also-rans with little to recommend them by beyond nice art or a novel aesthetic. Strip away the literal candy coating on Candy Flurry, for instance, and you're left with the basic concept of X-Arm filtered through a bog-standard battle exam arc. Put aside the practiced, almost calligraphic line art, and Nehru, the way of the martial artist, is just a boring high school thing where the characters spend 15 pages talking about martial arts for every one where they actually do them. Zip Man had some stylin' pop-culturally referential tokusatsu suit designs, but was otherwise just your run-of-the-mill teen superhero bullshit. Love Rush is literally just a harem manga with Monster Girls. Like, if you typed Monster Girl harem manga into Dali, I'm pretty sure the results would be indistinguishable. But you know, the, the girls are at least cute, and harems tend to sell. Most of these series that were dropped, at least you can see why they might have been given the chance to fail in the first place. There's clearly something there in the concept or pilot, just nowhere near enough to carry a whole series. Earthchild, which they literally canceled last week, would be the most recent example of this. But then there's shit like Bone Collection, a gag manga that isn't funny at all, ever, not once, not even by accident, which also tries to be a harem manga without a single remotely appealing female character in terms of looks or personality anywhere in sight, and one of those horny battle manga where the protag powers up by feeling up a lady, except feeling her up is just a precursor to yanking random bones out of her body, which isn't sexy, even if they come out through her boobs or thighs or whatever. Manga with such obvious, glaring conceptual faults that you seriously wonder if the editor who approved them is even okay. You know, the kind of manga most of you clicked on this video hoping to hear me rip on. And after what I said about Time Paradox Ghost Rider, I'd be a downright hypocrite if I didn't, so... We're now officially done with the analytical archaeology portion of this video. It's finally time to dance on some graves. After a quick word from our sponsor. 
We finally done it, boys. The last one is ours. Ring of the Dead, that is. Never thought I'd see the day, old friend. Especially after we were canceled. Hush now, son. You never know. I say you never know when Jump Editorial's listening in. Quite right. And we can't have them stepping in before we claim our prize. Yes, at long last, the powdered elixir of rejuvenation and immortality. Said to be made of the same stuff as life itself. Zombie powder. G fuel. What? Yes, G. I say G fuel. Raw power in powdered form, able to fill a man with enough energy to wake the dead and focus his mind until the impossible, like a 360 no scope, becomes all too easy. Okay, but what's more, it's both delicious and sugar free, able to take on any flavor the drinker desires, from Spyro dragon fruit. To, to Rick and Morty portal fluid. Yeah, I know. I've been trying to tell you guys. You can just order G Fuel from the back of a magazine or from gfuel.com. It's even 30% off with the promo code BASEMENT. Well then, that's a lot of pointless murders I can never take back. Who wants a drink? Okay, now it's time for grave dancing. Though, I must say, Hi-Fi Cluster's self-evident eagerness to jam entire boots down its throat does make me somewhat hesitant to put my dancing shoes anywhere near it, dead or alive. These things are leather, but there's just so much else to clown on here that I simply have no choice but to risk the slobber. Our hero, Peta, yes, that's his real name, is a Deku-type social outcast with a rare inability to use his world's default power system, which will later grant him access to even more powerful powers than regular people get, but for now, he gets bullied over it. So, in order to feel special, he starts skipping power system school to hang out with the wrong crowd at a pizza place where he works as a delivery boy. A wrong crowd that honestly looks like an anime club LARPing as hardcore gangsters. Like, I don't know what this artist was thinking trying to make barcodes the unifying aesthetic signature of his cyberpunk world, but it looks so bad. And it's not just a fashion failure, it's tied directly to the power system, which lets any person download any skill directly to their brain by slapping a barcode sticker on themselves, which looks so lame, I probably wouldn't use labels even if they were real. By battle manga standards, the things they let you do are also pretty lame, just like driving good or shooting good, but that's where hi-fis come in. They're special golden labels that only certain people can use, instilled not just with regular skills, but the genius abilities of history's greatest geniuses. So if you have Samurai Kojiro Sasaki's label, for instance, his legendary sword skills let you cut bullets out of the air. Or if you have Socrates' label, you can see through walls because of his famous insight you see. And then Isaac Newton's label lets you control gravity. Okay, so there's obviously no consistency or logic to what these things do or how they work, but that's true of a lot of great shonen power systems that people love. Rule of cool and all that. But the thing about, for instance, stands is that they're sexy anime robot ghosts, not glorified grocery stickers. So yeah, this manga ain't getting that pass. Anywho, the gang-affiliated pizza place sometimes has paid a smuggle stolen hi-fis for them, but it's on a regular pizza delivery that he randomly bumps into that cop with the hero complex from earlier. Said cop tries to question him, but then some bakugos from his school show up in this random public park to bully him. And then his hot childhood friend also randomly shows up to tell them off, which is real convenient because it means that she can then stay back to dump Peta's backstory on the cop and audience while he's busy going off to screw up a job and make his bad influence friends turn on him so an action scene can happen. An action scene with some of the most atrocious pacing I've ever seen, straight up nonsensical page layouts, and tiny panels full of cramped dialogue boxes that pull your eye all over the page on weird tangents right next to these massive, mostly empty splash panels that waste several entire pages of space. But even worse than that is the artwork, which 
I guess is technically competent in terms of lighting and anatomy, but conveys zero sense of motion or momentum. All the character poses look like poses, like the manga is depicting a cosplay shoot of itself. And on the rare occasions that it does try to employ motion effects, the effect is just embarrassing. Like, actually, what is going on with his elbow there? But even worse than that even worse thing is the structure of the story itself, or perhaps I should say the complete and total lack thereof. So Grills McGee asks Peta to deliver a black market hi-fi, but then it accidentally bonds with him because he's the protagonist, so the gang starts beating him up over his lost merchandise and also lures his childhood friend to their hideout so they can... I mean, it's a bad manga, you can guess what they were gonna do. And like a true peta male, our hero is helpless to stop it. But then, just in the nick of time, the cop arrives to deliver 14 straight pages of mostly exposition and trash talk, which are then followed by seven pages in which the gangbanger whips out his shotgun and the spread gets deflected, so he runs off to hold the childhood friend at knife point with his CQC label, causing Peta to realize that he can see weak points in an enemy's defense with his new hi-fi ability, but he doesn't have a gun or shooting label to take advantage of it, so he just tackles the baddie, who runs away while Peta goes to pick up his childhood friend, then then, suddenly, without a transition, everyone's outside in the alley behind the building where the gangbanger's van is, which he then uses to try to run them over, but then, most of two pages is dedicated to showing us how long Mr. Copman's extendo sword baton is, and then he uses that to cut the van in half. And it's finally over! Except for the other 17 chapters, of course, which, full disclosure, I, I didn't read all of because the ones that I did were just as unreadable as what I just showed you. Like, what the fuck is with this splash page? What order do the panels at the bottom even go in? And given the caliber of artists and storytellers that Jump has rejected over the years, it feels grossly unfair to me that they would give anyone the chance to make mistakes this incredibly basic. Still, it's not quite the worst cancelled Jump manga that I've had the displeasure of reading. No, that distinction goes to Tokyo Shinobi Squad, which is actually pretty competent, in some cases even exceptional, in terms of its art direction and visual storytelling, thanks to the talents of Kento Matsura. But that only makes it all the more baffling that some Jump editor chose to pair those talents with the truly atrocious writing of Yuki Tanaka. Here's the premise. In the near cyberpunky future of 2049, Tokyo has become the world's premier hub of crime and corruption. This has led to a resurgence of shinobi, who now serve as spies, mercenaries, and private security for the various organizations and individuals vying for power in the city, using their physics-defying ninpo techniques to balance the scales against heavily armed gangs, cyborg warriors, private armies, and other obligatory cyberpunk goon variants. So far, so eh, good, actually. That's an aesthetically striking concept for a setting with a lot of potential for creative superpowers and character designs, but hasn't been done that much in Jump, so I could see it succeeding. But the devil's in the details on this one, specifically the details of how Tokyo got to be like that. See, back in 2030, Shinzo Abe, who apparently didn't get Shinzo abe in this timeline, launched the construction of a massive, globe-spanning Hyperloop network connecting Japan's capital to Russia, China, and America. He believed that this act of super-globalization would bring trade and prosperity to the nation. But... Instead, all the loops brought in were massacres, slums, terrorism, and the fusion of business and organized crime. All things that, historically, Japan has never had any problems with, especially not that last one. What's a Yakuza? Never heard of it. Clearly, crime and violence are exclusively foreign problems that filthy foreigners will bring in and spread through Japan like a disease. Manga's words, not mine. Also the manga's words, like 
the very first ones we ever hear from its protagonist on page four in response to seeing a shootout on a Japanese highway. What's become of this country? So much for globalization. Now, to me, the... I would call it absurd pig ignorance as to how literally anything works that this world building is rooted in is in itself a story flaw. But even if you think all perspectives are valid or even agree with the underlying right of Shinzo Abe ultranationalist sentiment on display here, you gotta admit, it's pretty poor form to use your story's hero as a political mouthpiece before we even know his fucking name. That name, by the way, is Jin Narumi, and everyone in the Tokyo Underground has already heard it by the time this manga begins, because he is simply the bestest, coolest, smartestest ninja there ever was. At the tender age of 19, he's already founded his own elite ninja agency to rival the biggest of big boys, and mastered the extremely complex ninpo art of electromagnetic manipulation, which apparently took him five whole years all off screen. Every time this manga introduces a new ninpo power, it notes how many years of training are needed to master it, but not once do we see any of that training on the actual page, nor do we see any of the exploits that lead average shinobi with way more experience to react to Jin's name with fear and reverence, while even Tokyo's top shinobi dogs put respect on it at the very least. From the moment the story begins, Jin is simply the coolest guy who's always right and always kicks the asses of everyone who's wrong or who messes with his friends. And despite running like 10 chapters longer than almost everything else I've talked about today, Tokyo Shinobi Squad gives him less development in its entire run than the rest of them managed for their protagonists in their pilot chapters. And this shows, I think, a fundamental misunderstanding of what people actually like about shonen manga. It's not just about staring at cool drawings of cool dudes doing cool stuff, reading the comic book equivalent of a wrestling promo. It's about experiencing the relatable journeys that led those dudes to become that cool in the first place. This young Thai boy named N, who hires Jin to protect a legendary memory manipulating Ninpo scroll that he inherited from his dad, is in theory supposed to fill that role for the audience as the plucky sidekick, but in practice, his job is mostly just to ask questions so there can be exposition dumps, and then approximately once per fight, he'll be real nervous, but then get over it at the last minute and do a brave thing that helps to save the day. Then there's a time skip right at the end, and suddenly he's the exact same character as Jin, doing the exact same stuff that Jin did in the first chapter, because mirroring the start of a story at its end point is a very easy way to make it feel kind of profound when you don't actually have anything new or interesting to say about its characters or setting. Which this manga definitely didn't, because despite employing that time skip, it still manages to end on a factory default, our manga may have been cancelled. But someday soon, we'll take down the big bad together cliffhanger splash page, offering zero closure on any plot or character threads from throughout its entire run. Which in that ending's defense, I guess? The manga doesn't actually have that many of, because the rest of its characters are all fucking one-dimensional objects who exist solely to do ninja fights and make Jin Narumi look cool, and also get naked if they're women. Jin is occasionally joined on missions by two other squad mates, one of whom uses Ninpo that lets him turn into a tiger. His name is Taiga. That's literally all you need to know about him. And the other one, Papillon, just happens to be a former world-famous model, despite also being only 19, who pretty much never wears clothes, and even when she does, her ninpo is basically a mix of best genist and Bayonetta's powers, so literally every time she launches an attack or gets hit, part of them gets torn off. And would you believe it, the first and only fight that she has with another ninja in the entire series just happens to be against a guy whose ninpo technique makes his tongue really long so he can lick people to death. Desperate for readers much, dude? 
Later on, when Jin is in the hospital, she rushes over to confess the crush that she obviously has on him, because what other reason would there be to put a woman in a shonen? And then an old lady bumps into her from behind, resulting in an accidental Naruto Sasuke kiss, and that's the conclusion to her entire character arc. Seriously. If you told me this was an intentional parody of how bad shonen manga use their love interests, I'd believe you. Oh, and speaking of shonen parodies, Jin also has a rival from his teen ninja days who's literally just Metal Bat from One Punch Man. Or, I mean, he's really just a generic pompadoured boncho type dude of the variety that Metal Bat was making fun of, but I really wanted to use that parody segue, so... Here we are. And his soul-defining trait, besides the pompadour, is that he has a crush on Papillon too. So, of course, he sees that accidental smooch and gets super duper mad about it. But then, all of a sudden, the author was told he only had two chapters left to wrap up this bitch. So he had to drop that so that they could go home, where Jin's mentor, who's also the head of the Shinobi Association, shows up out of nowhere to tell us that a big bad exists and is plotting big bad stuff with some of the other villains, which will never get to see happen, before wasting most of the remaining pages on a completely pointless fight, which we then time skip over the end of. But wait, it gets worse, because if you thought the heroes were poorly written, wait till you see the villains. In chapter two, there's this little side story about an old shopping arcade that's been busted up by Yakuza thugs working for a slimy real estate dude who wants to put a big mall there, which is a pretty common trope in anime and manga. It's an easy way to comment on the loss of more traditional Japanese spaces to rampant commercialism while setting up a villain with a simple, easy to understand motivation, greed. But even though this dude is only around for like literally four pages, that's not enough for Tokyo Shinobi Squad. No, it needs us to understand that this guy isn't just a greedy asshole, he's also a psycho pervert who literally gets off on destroying people's homes with the people inside them. In another story, an evil modeling agent who hires ninjas to assassinate an amateur model so that one of her girls can take that model's place in a big show really likes lip filler. And I don't just mean she likes the way it makes her look, or even that she overuses it on her models because she likes the way it makes them look too much. No, her character profile lists injecting hyaluronic acid as her hobby, and she just sort of casually does it to herself in the middle of conversations. These aren't characters. They're not even caricatures. They're caricatures of caricatures of types of people the author obviously has beef with. If you've always wanted to see, ha ha, you're too late. I have already drawn you as the soy jack and me as the Chad, translated directly into a shonen battle manga, please go to therapy. But while you're on the wait list, I, I guess you could read Tokyo Shinobi Squad. The only villain the series treats as being even remotely sympathetic or redeemable is literally a terrorist cult leader because all he wants is to protect his home from the forces of globalization that have ruined it. And he just got led a little astray along the way. And by astray, I mean he brainwashes kidnapped children to be suicide bombers, which to be fair, in a series full of bad dudes who stab prostitutes to death just for affectionately rubbing their bald heads or turn their own subordinates into shaved ice bowls, which they then eat, is still the single most fucked up thing that anyone has done. Well, except maybe for the Shinobi Association themselves, who decided to make stopping that guy into a test for new squads, requiring them to spend several hours jumping through hoops and doing pointless fights for the test adjudicators before they finally tell them where to find the stolen VX gas that a child-sacrificing terrorist cult has imminent plans to unleash on the city. I could go on, but this is already the longest part of the video by a country mile, and I think I've sufficiently demonstrated how the writing in this series fails on 
literally every conceivable level. It's almost impressive, honestly, in the same way that getting a perfect zero on a test would be. Like, if Yuki Tanaka just did the exact opposite of whatever his storytelling instincts tell him to do, he could be one of the greatest mangaka to ever live. But he didn't, and he's definitely not, so here we are. Now, maybe it's also bad form to cap off a video about lost potential and dreams cut short by mercilessly shitting on a guy whose dream was cut short, but I like to keep things positive on this channel, and at the end of the day, good riddance to bad rubbish is just about the most and only positive thing one can reasonably hope to say about a canceled jump title. For the readers they did have, they're often a source of bitter disappointment. And for their creators, at best, they're a lesson to learn from if and when they ever get another shot. But I think we can learn from them too, and I hope that any aspiring writers and artists watching this now will carry at least a few lessons away from it. With the most important lesson of all being, don't write Tokyo Shinobi Squad. That said, if you can handle the perpetual sadness, and this is a topic that interests you, the cool dudes over at the Shonen Flop podcast cover a different cancelled jump manga every single week. And I may come back to the topic myself in the future, so let me know in the comments below if that's something you'd like to see. For now though, I'm Jeff Thu, your local manga undertaker, signing out from the Jump Graveyard.